The contemporary world is an orphan. It lacks fathers and those who give witness to fatherhood. There is no true brotherhood without the father. That's going to be my theme today, and that, that is a quote from uh, John Paul II. I want you to picture this scene. In a sparkling canteen in a community centre in a poor part of Birmingham, families talk quietly over their sandwiches. At the counter, a fight breaks out between five young men. The cook tries to calm the men down and asks them to leave, but it gets nastier. Chairs are thrown, a knife is produced. See them, see how angry they are, says an older man sitting outside. Not one of them ever knew their fathers. Ladywood in Birmingham is one of several UK districts where 70% of children are now raised in households without fathers. An astonishing one million children are growing up in these blighted communities, living without a father and rarely, if ever, meeting an adult man. According to a recent troubling study of family breakdown by the Centre for Social Studies in Britain, relationships break down fast and frequently. Children of single mothers often end up single mothers themselves. Absent fathers are a common factor amongst criminals, drug addicts and self-harmers. Absent fathers are a common factor among people imprisoned. Girls groomed for sex, drug addicts, rioters, self-harmers uh, and young suicides. Yet rarely is this mentioned in the media. So this is my theme, where have the fathers gone? In psychoanalysis, the question of the father was considered of central importance in the 1950s. For the influential French psychoanalyst Jacques Lacan uh, said that the whole Freudian corpus could be summed up by the question, what is it to be a father? The father was much more than just a, a role model or a significant carer. The in the name of the father formula that Lacan uh, used, the so-called paternal metaphor, implies so much more, approaching the ineffable Our Father of the Lord's Prayer. And when Lacan referred to the father of the name, he was invoking Genesis. The father introduces what Lacan calls the register of the symbolic, which accomplishes the introduction of a world, a world out there. And as Kevin was saying a minute ago, uh, based on language, on the word. So it's the father who is the spokesman, the father who does the speaking. And when I say father here, I'm not meaning just the actual father. Of course, it can be other people, let me make that clear as well. But it's the functioning of the father. All that is good and highest in civilization is derived from, as Freud reminds us, the ego ideal, which answers to everything that is expected at the of the higher nature of man. As the substitute for the longing for the father, it contains a germ from which all religions have evolved. Um, so, uh, and in his last book, Moses and Monotheism, uh, Freud wrote, we know that in the mass of mankind there's a powerful need for an authority who can be admired. It is a longing for the father felt by everyone from childhood onwards, end of quote. While it's true to say that all actual fathers are less than ideal and that this father longing, as Freud called it, has again the structure of a myth, however, to invoke the mythic is yet again to underline its eternal importance psychologically. 
Lacan was very clear about this, as I said, during the 1950s. However, the father, mastery, authority, in any form, has long since been deemed castrated, a spent force. His rule is over. The father has disappeared, and Lacan seemed duly to fall in line with this theme during the Cultural Revolution of the 1960s. He says, what Oedipus, Moses, and the primal father had in common, that they are now deemed, as far as he was concerned, to be part of Freud's dream. No longer a reality, but Freud's, Freud's neurosis. And the younger Lacanians have duly followed suit, the younger analysts. <clears throat> now, and then the belief in the longing for the father is regarded as a typically neurotic symptom. Um, and the other post-Freudian analysts weren't much better in this respect because they went then to focus on the mother and the mother's nurturing uh, and the father then literally is simply just a support to the mother. Now, if we come to the... Um, 21st century, and in particular the last five years, not content with just the castrated, weakened father, largely now out of the picture, there has been much written on the so-called pathology of the patriarchy. It's actually a sort of disease. And indeed masculinity itself. Toxic masculinity. Nothing less then an Oedipal parricide or fratricide is called for across the board in all the media now. This is very commonly reported, as I'm sure you'll know. But the psychoanalytic insight tells us, or tells me and tells a few people uh, still, uh, emphatically that the father creates or mediates a world. No father means no coherent world, leading to confusion and very likely psychosis or perversion. Now, the whole process of defamiliarization has been going on for a long time. Long before the 1960s, societies have been undergoing a process of of defamiliarization in the process of modernization. Industrialization needed women to work. Um, in Russia a century ago, Lenin's ideological assault um, specifically targeted marriage and the family. He equated marriage with slavery. He granted easy divorce and abortion as early as 1920. Divorce was no longer just for the rich. Breaking family bonds enabled women trapped and isolated on rural farms um, to be more easily socialized and indoctrinated. Soviet realist art depicted the new Soviet worker woman like a man with broad shoulders. Now, without asking how that experiment in communism fared in relation to the family, two generations later, Radicals asserted, that is in the 1960s, that the bourgeois family should be a key target of the left. They claimed the social, functioning, the social functioning of the family is an ideological conditioning device. From left and right, the family was undermined because during the 1980s, with globalization and capitalism in its latest phase, cause further atomization of life. Everyone must fend for themselves. You're on your own. And as the bonds are loosened, as the bonds are loosened between people, the father is often the first to go because his spiritual bond with his children is weaker when compared to the power of the mother's jouissance. Now, jouissance is a word introduced into the language uh, by Lacan, and jouissance has a, an interesting and really indescribable meaning, which means something to do with pleasure, but much more than pleasure. Pleasure mixed with pain. 
the ple- I suppose drug addiction, the drug high, is the best example of jouissance. Um, so um, how are we going to work this in? Um, the, um, let me see, I've just lost my place there for a second. Um, uh, so, oh yeah, thus we ha- have ended up with a, a, a fatherless situation, and now it's, um, the slogan is, it's forbidden to forbid. Not forbid, which is, was the father's, the no of the father, or as Lacan used to like to pun, le nom, the name of the father and the no of the father. Um, so, apparently, um, I'll come back to jouissance in a minute when I find that place. Oh, yes. Sorry, as the bonds are loosened, the father is the first to go. Because his spiritual bond with his children is weaker when compared to the power of the mother's jouissance. Thus, we have ended up... Now, the power that the mother gives birth to the child and her, her intense pleasure, pain in that process of giving birth is part of the Oedipus complex. Uh, and this is when the father co- needs to come in, this is in theory, at age two to four, to remove the child from the mother's orbit and out into the world. Because before that, the child doesn't have a world. It's all revolves, <clears throat> revolves around the mother. So, So, apparently, the progressive ideal for Westerners, the so-called Swedish model, was driven by one single overarching goal, to sever the traditional, some would say natural, ties between its citizens, be they those that bound children to their parents, workers to their employers, wives to their husbands, or the elderly to their families. Instead, individuals were encouraged mostly by financial incentive or disincentive, but also through legislation, uh, le- legislation, propaganda, and social pressure to take their place in the collective and, in ne- if necessary, become dependent on the state. Um, but the Swedish system is best understood not in terms of socialism, but in terms of Rousseau. Rousseau was an extreme egalitarian, and he really hated any kind of dependence. Dependence on other people destroyed your integrity, he said, or your authenticity. And if we go back between the two world wars, uh, millions of men had died in conflict, and because the norm for children Um, then was to be brought up by their widowed mothers, single parents. But one of the key differences between then and now, however, was that the extended family played a crucial role in raising the child. Grandparents, siblings, aunts, uncles, united to help provide the stable family life missing for so many present-day children. Back in 1926... Uh, millions of British working class people lived in conditions of absolute, uh, uh, sorry, of ob- abject poverty, poor hunger, poor housing, unemployment, uh, and the absence of a breadwinner owing to the carnage. Nevertheless, even under these conditions, the violent offender rate per 100,000 of the population in Britain, this is according to... Um, a man who spent 30 years in the uh, criminal justice system, David Fraser, the the offender rate, the violent offender rate, per 100,000 of the population was just 4.4, whereas today it's over 1,400 per 100,000. And apparently, according to Fraser... And there are now 15 times more acts of wounding and, dang- and endangering life, uh, 15 times more acts of wounding than there were in the 1950s. So when we look back and say the good old days or whatever, there is some truth in that. Criminologist Martin Glynn, 
who was raised by a single mother, wrote a report called Dad and Me, which explores the effects of absent fathers today. He has evidence that shows that children abandoned by their fathers are beset by self-loathing and drawn to inappropriate role models, such as gang leaders, uh, older lovers, and worse. As long as 12 years ago in a discussion on Newsnight about a UNICEF report on childhood in Britain, a number of experts and policymakers talked about the breakdown of community. A community worker, Tony Sewell, son of Jamaican immigrants, who had been involved with these communities for two decades, asked, where are the fathers? Where are the adult males, fathers, uncles, grandfathers, who will control the youth? He says, adults have gone AWOL. Sewell ran a charity called Generating Genius, which has helped poor black children out of the ghetto uh, and got them into o Oxbridge and other Russell Group universities. Talking about knife crime, so prevalent in, in the UK, uh, Sewell says, lack of policing is the answer, but not by the police, but by parents, if the kids have any at all. Sewell asks, why are we making excuses regarding the absence of fathers from these families? At least 50% of black children have no dad living at home. The problem is nobody wants to go there for political reasons. The police don't want to go there, nor do the social workers, the politicians, or the black community itself, which then complains that it's been victimized. And so the problem of fatherlessness is never addressed. Sewell also blames the myth of the Afro-Caribbean mum some black mothers indeed work wonders despite the absence of the father, but not all can and neither should they be required to. It's a culture that needs to change for the sake of the children. Instead, he says, adults now fear children and children go in fear of other children. Children need to have uncles and aunts in addition to their real relatives who were significant role models, and where have they all gone? We says we should all adopt a child, but people are afraid of being accused of being child abusers. David Lammy, who you might know is a British Labour MP for Tottenham, warned after the London riots in August, I think it was 2011, uh, that areas like his, there are some, none of the basic starting assumptions are of two adults who want to start a family, raise children together, love them, nourish them, and lead them to, to independence. He says, today, one in four children is brought up by a single parent compared to one in 14 in 1972. The parents are not married, and the child has come, frankly, out of casual sex, he says. The father isn't present, and he's not expected to be. Uh, there aren't the networks of extended families to make up for it. So Lamy recalls the loss of his own West Indian father after his taxidermy business failed and his parents separated. My most enduring memory, he says, was of being pulled towards him as we stood on platform five in King's Cross Station. Just two years earlier, on that very same platform, he had told me how proud he was of me for having won a choral scholarship to a boarding school in Peterborough. This time was different. Hugging me close, he whispered, take care of mum, okay? He was leaving the next day for the United States, age 12. I was returning to school. For my father, America held out the promise of a fresh start. He had always been someone I looked up to when he lived with us, but he became unimaginably more important the day he left. Justice Sheehan, who helped establish the prisoners' rights organization in Ireland in the 1970s, who became well known for representing vulnerable groups in Irish culture at the fringes of society, Sheehan um, says this, 
Much of the misery seen in Irish courts is caused by the lack of a father figure in offenders' lives. We expect social workers and the HSE to father and mother these children. It's an extraordinarily difficult task. I remember one case, he says. This child from the west of Ireland, at 13 he'd been in 40 placements since the age of three, abandoned by his father and intermittently abandoned by his mother. What has happened is that society today has allowed the role of the father to be undermined to the great detriment in human terms, but also in financial terms. One of the things that we have to do is to encourage young men to be responsible for their children. We have to go back and start at that point. We have allowed the position and the importance of the father to become so eroded. End of quote from Justice Sheehan. And even back in 2008, Senator Obama told an audience, children who grow up without a father are five times more likely to live in poverty and commit crime, nine times more likely to drop out of school, and 20 times more likely to end up in prison. Paula Maycock of TCD, School of Social Work, speaking on Pat Kenny program recently, linked homelessness with fatherlessness. 60% 60 to 70% of homelessness is one parent families headed by women. Kenny called this the feminization of homelessness. So, and so on. Raise any of these issues with professionals, however, politicians and so on, as I often do, and generally the predictable response or even with other analysts and therapists. The predictable response is either complete silence, you know, and sort of turning away, or at best, an awkward rejoinder. Look, that father's gone, and he's not coming back. Get used to it. However, within psychoanalysis, there is a lingering sense or an undercurrent that we have lost something very precious, this mystery of the father. In fact, we seem to be in two minds. First, bring on the loss with a kind of saintly forbearance, a full acceptance the father is not coming back, and we try to find some other substitutes to create a world for the child. Two, a constant repetition uh, of the name of the father, which is me, right? A sense of nostalgia at his loss. And Jacques-Anne Miller, who is the present head of the World Association for Psychoanalysis, um, he lists society's pathologies. Now, this is back in, I think, about 2011. And it's interesting, he lists them. Detraditionalization, loss of bearings, disarray of identifications, dehumanization of desire, violence in the community, suicide among the young, and the acting out of the mentally ill. And as Miller says, psychologists, he means the whole gamut of mental health workers, are being called upon to constitute or reconstitute the social bond. Um, so that's him in there. But listen to what he says, if I can find it now. Um, uh, in um, more recently, I think probably 2019. Um, this is the same person. In spite of, uh, sorry, Miller refers to some psychoanalysts, all right? some, very few, remaining attached to obsolete beliefs. And the most ignorant analysts and the least likable of the lot cry over the name of the father, dreaming of re-establishing his reign. Note the pejorative slur from the old Maoist. He was a Maoist back in the 70s against those analysts and, against, and his own contradiction with the comments that I've just listed. 
So there's two moods, if you like, amongst analysts. Um, Meantime, the wider implications of the no father, the frontline services struggle to cope. And we get story after story of desperate parents, Joe Duffy every day, more or less, who cannot control their children. In the extreme, paramilitaries perform punishment shootings in Northern Ireland on antisocial youth deemed out of control. Likewise, paramilitaries uh, were used on sink housing estates to discipline drug pushers using so-called alternative methods. And now you know we're in trouble, and you know we're in trouble when youth stops fearing the leaders of Sinn Féin. That things have got pretty bad. Globally, the situation is quite alarming. The law is becoming less and less effective, and all the time the law being connected ultimately to the father. Uh, and it's always less effective, finding itself behind the curve of the real. According to Lynn Owens of Britain's National Crime Agency, all types of tran transnational crime are up. Child abuse, modern slavery, human trafficking, cybercrime, county lines, which always sounds like picnics and things, but it isn't, um, illicit finance, criminal waste disposal, poisoning of the groundwater, they're all increasing. And apparently a report seen by the, 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 the London Times has revealed that metropolitan police are ignoring about a third of all crime. Um, after just one telephone call with a victim. Crimes such as burglary, low-level assault, criminal damage can all be dismissed according to policy secretly introduced by Scotland Yard a couple of years ago. So in Britain, crimes that end in prosecution are down to a, just under 8%. And in Ireland, almost 8,000 reported crimes by more than 3,000 children and young people went unpunished due to the serious problems with the Garda Youth Referral Scheme. In part of a series of programs to mark the end of the millennium, John Simpson, uh, BBC chief correspondent, interviewed the head of Interpol who acknowledged openly back then that the world's criminal syndicates are beyond the reach of international and national policing bodies. Human trafficking is second only to drugs for criminal profitability. And recently, we've been told that Ireland is easy on traffi trafficking. It's the worst in Europe in this respect. The film Doing Money is based on the true story of Anna. This was shown on RT a few years back. A student from Romania who was kidnapped on the streets of London in broad daylight on the way home from her cleaning job and forced to become a sex slave in pop-up brothels in different cities across Northern Ireland and the Republic. Rejected by her parents back home, who then regarded her as a prostitute, she asked... Do you, think, do you know what it feels like to be totally alone? Totally alone in the whole world when you finally know that nobody's coming. The contemporary world is an orphan. And it is women who are most at risk. We have the story here, only recently, that Gardi have not been able, not been responding to 999 calls. In the UK, most rapes are going under-investigated. And there are parts uh, of our big cities where the law does not really operate. It's no longer preventative policing. It operates after the crime. In Frank Berry's 1917 film set in Dublin called Michael Inside, Young Michael 
is living in a in in a kindly with sorry with a kindly elderly grandfather called Francis, played by Roddy Lawler. Michael was played by David Flynn. While his dad was in jail for drug offences, Francis understands the lawless world and the perils lurking around every corner of this rundown Dublin housing estate. 18-year-old Michael, already on probation for making every effort, but making every effort to stay on the proper path when he's caught with drugs he was keeping for a friend's older brother. He is sentenced to three months in prison. Once there, he is forced to fight for his life as violence escalates. His grandfather is threatened by the drugs gang to, to get 2,000 euros to pay for the confiscated drugs. Michael is released but goes after the gang that's harassing them. He's back inside again on just the day when he's accepted onto a course to study in social care which would have taken him out of the violent underworld. The point here is that the symbolic father is largely ineffective, and so violence escalates with the law intervening only after the event. When Michael is briefly back out on the city streets, the grey horizon of the housing estate seems as bleak as the prison just depicted in the film. Um, So if we follow Mary Eberstadt, now she's an American essayist and novelist, in an article, an important article she wrote in First Things, called Rage of the Fatherless. That's the name of the article. Following a summer of rage in 2020 in 50 American cities, none of it reported, or virtually none of it reported, um, except peaceful protests are reported, uh, in our media. She says, and it's an extended quote, what is happening, uh, what is happening to America is an excruciating, excruciatingly painful truth that life without the father, life without the father, life without God the father and filial piety towards the country are not the socially neutral options that contemporary liberalism holds them to be. The sinkhole into which all three have collapsed is now a public hazard. The threefold crisis of paternity is depriving many young people, especially young men, of reasons to live as rational and productive citizens. As the, and this is a quote from her. As the Catholic theologian Deborah Savage uh, put it recently, reflecting on America's youth, they have been left alone in a cosmos with nothing to guide them, not even a firm grasp of what constitutes their basic humanity, and so no means of finding the way home. So I'll end very shortly now. So there are three key formulations. I'll get to a couple of them that psychoanalysis can uh, teach us. The loss of the father doesn't just stay at that, a, a sort of an empty space. What takes his place is the primal father of jouissance, Freud's reference to the primal father of jouissance, who is, a, who is basically a horrendous figure. Um, so that... In other words, when we lose the relatively benign father uh, um, of ordinary life, um, what, re what is re replaces him uh, is the primal father, something to, close to criminality, to violence, paedophiles, warlords, you can name them all. So Lacan... It was interesting here, he said, it's true, old father Karamazov said, if God the father is dead, then everything is permitted. This is a famous quote. If God is dead, then everything is permitted. But Lacan rejoined, God is dead means nothing is permitted anymore. This is because the father was murdered. We have murdered him, Nietzsche said. He did not just die, he was murdered. Therefore, nothing 
in the strong sense, is permitted. If God is dead, nothing is permitted in a fundamentalist clampdown on everything. And this made more explicit since COVID with a demand for compliance may yet be our geopolitical fate during the 21st century. 